And then uh, I guess we can start. All right, thank you, Lucas. Thanks everyone for being here for this um, kind of whirlwind tour of the Hugging Face ecosystem. And the reason we are introducing this now and not later after you learn about transformers, which are, which are the models that this library got big um, implementing is because there are a lot of layered APIs, which is often the case in these frameworks. And it's super easy to get started playing with these technologies. And it, even if you don't immediately understand what is going on behind the scenes, it's, it's good to have some software practice before you actually listen to the theory. And so I'm going to try to cover a bit of everything. I'm not going to go into too much detail for, for, for one um, part of the library, just to, 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 to give you a taste of what you can achieve um, with Hugging Face. So um, on the bottom in the blue are the Hugging Face libraries. You have tokenizers, which handle all the pre-processing of, of the data that's being fed into your models. Data sets, which are obviously the data that is being um, fed into your models and in, in the center, which is the reason why Hugging Face became such a huge player in the market is Transformers, which is a very special deep network architecture that is very suitable for text, but also as it seems also very suitable for images and for reinforcement learning. We won't be talking about Accelerate either in this session or in this course, because this is a PyTorch only um, um, library that will help you paralyze your code. There are other ways to do that in TensorFlow, which is what we're covering. So we're only focusing on these three here, tokenizers, transformers, and data sets. And on top in the red is the Hugging Face Hub, which is all the major frameworks have a hub where models live. And the Hugging Face Hub is no different. And it's a collection of Git repositories, a huge repository of all the models, all the data sets, and everything else that's been trained. And let's just start by going to, to the hub, actually. Um, if we go to models, for example, we can see that there are 40, about 40,000 trained models. So whatever your use case is for this seminar, when you're implementing something, odds are that someone has already implemented something that's very close to what you want. If you want to do text classification, you can start with that and like search for whatever your task is. A speech. Wait. Okay, maybe not hate speech, but definitely emotion. Um, data sets on emotions. This is the data set that we'll end up playing with later. Everything behind the scenes is a Git repo. If you're familiar with Git, you can already peek behind the scenes and see that this is nothing more than hosted versioning with Git large file system that lets you just store terabytes of data. Um, if we go to models, for example. Very quick interruption, Chris, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I just now had, uh, it occurred to me, maybe the search on Hugging Face itself is not very good. When I search for hate speech and Hugging Face on Google, I find hate speech models. Yeah, it's very keyword, I think, based, which is why like whatever uh, small typo, or if you type it not the way it is, it's not... Uh, it's not found your right. Exactly. And th so this is regard, if you know what you're searching for, at least uh, uh, syntax wise, then you use this. Otherwise, I'd suggest yeah. use Google and uh, be faster, uh, more more fuzzy in the search, basically. Yeah. 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 Very good okay, point. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, on that note, please do interrupt me without raising your hand whenever you feel like it, because it makes it much easier for me to, if this like turned into a conversation as opposed to just me looking at Lucas and, and presenting. Um, of course, also, if you don't have a mic active right now, you can always write in the chat and I will send me regularly, then just pass the messages on to Chris. Thank you. So this is a random model that I went to. This is Roberta based, and you see that there's a lot of metadata available. We can see that it's available in PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, even Rust, that it's been trained on the book corpus and Wikipedia. And if we go to files and versions, it's nothing more than a glorified Git repository. So we have PyTorch weights, TensorFlow weights, Flax weights. We have the vocabulary of the tokenizer. And as it happens, the, the way you'll interact with Tensor or with Hugging Face from your application is with two big functions. One that 
pulls things from these Git repos and one that pushes things. So from pre-trained is what will pull these weights and push to hub or the methods that you'll keep coming across. Um, and that's it for the live demo. I'll go to my settings now. I go to access tokens. This is all things you can do later on your own time. You're not meant to be coding along. I'll copy, I'll copy my token because I want to actually um, push things to the hub from the notebook. So I'll run this cell, copy my token, log in, and I'm successfully logged in and we can resume um, the demo. So what we'll be covering in this demo are data sets, as I said, which is, as Benno said, one of the most important things is data collection. So you have to find good quality data that is well aligned with your task to be able to train anything. You have to pre-process it in a way that is understandable by uh, your neural network. So this is where the tokenizers library comes in and the meat of the whole thing is the transformers library, which are a selection of all the models that you could need if you're if you want to train a transformer. Um, we're gonna start with tokenizers and actually, no, we're not gonna start with tokenizers. I want, this is something that I added last minute because I want to give you a taste of things you can do without actually using lower level libraries. We can start looking at pipelines and pipelines are a software artifact that encapsulates everything that you need to, to do with text. So pipelines take in text and output text and, and and inside them, there's a lot of pre-processing being done. There's the model being loaded, um, inference being run and post-processing being run. So that all you need to do is start with text. And to that end, I went on Google yesterday and just Googled Leipzig to see a review. And this is a review of the Gewand House. And I really like this because there are a few typos, acoustic, Pluto missing in some places. So it's it's a huge use, use case for neural networks. So because you're not using bag of words, so you can afford to have some variation in, in the spelling. So I'm just gonna take this text that I took from this um, user's review of the Gewandhaus who, who very much enjoyed the, the Kapellmeister Andres Nelsons who listened to Bruckner and who only came to Leipzig to actually listen to the orchestra. And when we load these pipelines, we can choose any model that's well suited for our task. So this is a BERT model. Don't be um, too worried if you don't know what BERT is, you'll come to learn about it in, the, um, in later sessions. BERT is just a, an encoder model that can take text and perform sequence classification. And if we just load, the model into the pipeline object. Maybe while the model is loading, uh, just quickly mention there's a question in the chat that uh, which version has your transformer library because the package that the person installed does not have the pipelines module. So um, if you provide a pip or conga install version, that would be appreciated. I, the, the... We will upload the requirements.txt with pinned versions, but just let me double check. Hmm. 4.18 is what I'm using. Okay, that seems to resolve. Um, Thank you. And according to this pipeline that was not fine-tuned on Google reviews, but just on a sentiment data set, this is a positive text with um, probably a probability score of 999. We can also load a named entity recognition pipeline this time, it's a model that was fine-tuned on a famous data set, Connell 03, which is what um, a lot of times NER is benchmarked on. And just like that, we can already, without training, without knowing anything about these models, we can already use them 
in production, as it were. So we have Leipzig's location, the Gewandhaus Leipzig Orchestra as an organization, the Kapellmeister as a person, and so on and so forth. We can um, load a question answering pipeline this time fine-tuned on the squad data set, still the same model architecture, base. This one is a bit um, more fun to play with because there's a lot of variability as to what is. I'm just, okay. Um, just to be clear then, the, you're very welcome to code along, but it, I did not mean for this to be code along session. Um, so I'm not sure. This is running locally right now, so I don't know about the up uploaded version. Um, so if we ask this pipeline, these four questions, what city did I visit? Why did I visit the city? What music did the orchestra play and who led the orchestra? We can already get extremely good performance on, on, on this random snippet from the internet. So I visited Leipzig, why to, to have these, this experience with the orchestra? What did the orchestra play? And, and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, translation, also a task that, is, um, that has models uh, ready to be used. So this is a model from the Helsinki NLP group, specialized on English to German translation. And this one is, since it's sequence to sequence, it's a bit more demanding of my CPU. And it will take a second before outputting the German translation of the input text. And it's not quite there yet in terms of translation quality, but it's still quite impressive for something that's just running on my machine that I've never used before that, that I just loaded in one line of code. So now is the time to start to peel away these layers as to what is happening here. The first thing that is pre-processing, which is, what a tokenizer has to do. And the reason why tokenizers have their own section is because ever since the, 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 the huge proliferation that followed the, the attention is all you need paper. So all trans transformer models usually come with their own tokenizer. And it's a tokenizer that's trained on the corpus. So you can't just use the tokenizer from GPT-2 and input that into BERT because the variability comes from the fact that the tokenizer already has to start capturing some statistics about the data. And the, the way it works is that you have these set steps. Whenever you have to train a model from scratch, you also have to give some thought to what you're doing to pre-process your data. And it's just not, it's not just a, a simple dictionary style vocabulary as we demonstrated in the previous sections, but rather it's it's an algorithm that is run on your data set and that outputs a tokenization that is suited to your data set. So we will start by normalizing the data, basically cleaning it, removing any Unicode artifacts, any accents, um, lower casing until we end up with this clean version. We pre-tokenize, not because it's necessary, but it's just we have to feed the tokenizing algorithm chunks of text and it can't be streams of text. So we have to somehow split on something and usually white space is what people split on. Um, and then the model is trained and sometimes words will be tokenized into split sections that are called subwords, which is what you see here with this double hash. So this um, misspelling of today um, is being tokenized as TD and part of a word A. And then finally, because we want to, 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 to model some task, we have to also ingest some information into that tokenization. So we have to insert this CLS token, for example, which is, which stands for classifier token, because we want to be able to do sentence level classification as opposed to having an output for each of the tokens. So this through training will come to be represented as some sort of representation for the whole sentence, but we need to be able to tell the tokenizer, hey, I have these special tokens that I would like you to incorporate that do not occur in the corpus. And one of them is, for example, the separator that 
signal signal the end of a sentence. Um, this is a lot of talking about it. So let's just actually go into doing it. Um, I'm going to download the Gutenberg um, corpus from NLTK, which gives you a bunch of very small um, bite-sized corpora to play with. We are going to load Moby Dick into our um, um, Moby Dick raw variable. It's 1.19 megabytes of data. And we are going to import all the parts that we saw on the slide earlier. So we're going to import the tokenizer object, but also the normalizers, the pre-tokenizers, and the processors. Um, we are going to tell the model that we would like a token for unknown tokens, because the way these trained tokenizers work is that when you fit them on a corpus, it's next to impossible to to to, uh, to get an unknown token, because at the end of the day, you can always revert back to characters and tokenize a, a word that you've never seen down to its characters. So we have to explicitly add this unknown token in the same sense that we added it um, last week or in last session. We have to add padding tokens, classifier tokens, and the mask token. Um, and we initialize a tokenizer. Maybe just a short intersection here to tie in with the first session. Um, if you recall back then, we had the special zero that we inserted to pad all the sequences, which we did in the already number space of words. Um, and then we had to add one to the vocabulary size because we introduced this new kind of token. And we kind of do this here explicitly in the string directly by inserting these special reserved um, characters in there. Um, so we're not only limited to the zero anymore, but we can build a whole set of different special tokens um, to signify different things in our sequence. Exactly. Thank you. So we instantiate a custom tokenizer that is not trained yet, that knows nothing about what we want to achieve, except this is a tokenizer with the unknown token that we set in the previous slide. Um, this is a sequence of normalizers, a sequence of things that will clean the data. This is Unicode cleaning. This one will lowercase and this one will strip all accents. Now, this is just to demonstrate how this workflow usually um, is implemented. There are no accents in Moby Dick um, and no Unicode artifacts. We can define a sequence of normalizers like that. Same thing with the pre-tokenizer, which is what will trans transform the stream into separate tokens to be fed into the tokenization algorithm. This is splitting on space and punctuation. And we have to instantiate an actual trainer. Word piece here is one of the many algorithms that people use in practice to train tokenizers. So. Word piece is what is going to um, give you the rules for your specific corpus on how to tokenize it. And that's it. We just have to um, click on train, and it will take one second to train our tokenizer. And we can see that. It has 6,000 tokens because we told it, I would like you to run this algorithm with a high limit of 6,000. I want 6,000 tokens in my vocabulary, which leads, which leads it to, 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 to this quality of tokenizing into subwords. It, it knows the word token. Apparently, there is the word token in Moby Dick but not the word tokenizer. So instead of saying, I don't know this tokenizer word, it is able to say, okay, I know token. I'm gonna to split this word into token and the rest, I know the I's ending, uh, middle of the word, and I know the R ending, which is basically one character. And it's able to represent these words into tokens without losing information that would be lost if you just follow the dictionary. Um, approach. Um, one last thing, uh, and again, these, these are all things that you don't always need in practice, but 
are useful to know if you're training from scratch, if you have some special behavior and you don't have to worry about this code. The only thing it's doing is actually adding the CLS token and the separator token at the end of the sentence. And it's also teaching the tokenizer how to encode pairs of sentences because sometimes you have tasks that involve comparing two sentences that involve saying, hey, this is a sentence, is this sentence related to it? And you need a way to be able to encode that and feed it into your neural network. And this is taking these two sentences and creating this one sequence out of them, which is CLS, sentence, separator, sentence two, and separator. And this is the code that is teaching this tokenizer how to do it. Um, and now that we have a trained tokenizer, we actually want to use it with a neural network and we can't use it just yet because as we've learned, we need to feed tensors into the network. So we have to do one last thing, which is to wrap this tokenizer that we trained into a tokenizer object from the transformers library, which is where our models live. And if we just define this new tokenizer as a pre-trained tokenizer and feed the tokenizers that we trained into it, which is what this line here is doing, then we can have a tokenizer that is actually returning batches of tensors, specifically TensorFlow tensors, because I explicitly set it to that, but it can be non-PyO days that it's returning, it can be PyTorch tensors, um, and, and that's about it. It's, it also knows how to pad and how to um, put these attention weights to tell the neural networks that I've padded here, don't pay attention to this part of the token because the sentence is too short, but it needs to be, um, um, the batch needs to be regular size to be able to be performant on a GPU. You, can't, you, you can use ragged tensors, but in, it, usually it's better to have the same regular size and this is just being handled by the tokenizer. Um, on to data sets. Having a tokenizer is, is, is contingent on the fact that you have some data to train it on, and we will look at the data sets library. Um, Niklas last week, last session already introduced uh, the data sets API from TensorFlow, and the data sets library from Hugging Faces very heavily inspired by that. And you can read about that inspiration and the documentation, except that instead of TF records in the background for serialization, it's using Apache Arrow, which is a very um, battle tested library for column data sets. And this is just a code snippet that lets you um, load the entire English Wikipedia, which is about 15 gigabytes of clean text and only use 50 megabytes to do that. And the same memory mapping magic that's happening in the background, you don't have to know about to understand that. Just know that there is magic happening in the background, lets you iterate over the entire 18 gigabytes in about 70 seconds, which is um, quite impressive. When you, when you come to deal with data that large, um, it's, it's very good when your data input pipeline is not what's making your training slow, but rather the huge architecture that you're trying to train. Um, so one less thing to worry about. So let's start playing with the data sets library. We can actually list all the data sets that are available. And there are currently about 4,500 data sets. Um, we looked at the emotion data set earlier in, the, in, in search, um, but we can also list all data sets that have the word emotion in them because I'm interested in doing sentiment analysis and I figure the word emotion is relevant. You can see two sorts of hits here. There are these uh, TLD, top level domains, so things that don't have a username and these are official data sets and you don't need to um, specify your user or if if you're random, this could have been my data set, for instance, this is a, a rubrics user and they have a go emotions training data set. So 
I think we'll set up the emotion data set. We will load it using load data set and actually look at what the emotions object is. And maybe Lucas has a, an interjection while we wait for DNS to resolve. Um, actually, no. <laughs> um, maybe uh, more of a question. Um, is this being downloaded to the local machine now, or is this streamed over uh, HTTP or something like that? It's being it's being downloaded to my local machine. Um, I could have added a streaming equals true argument, and it would have streamed it like chunk by chunk, which would have been faster. But this is a small data set, and I've been having DNS issues today, yeah, which exactly. is, yeah, I think it's a light ish issue with DNS resolution for Kabel Deutschland, but um, we might have to, hmm. let me see. Okay, let me stop that because this is taking way too long. This is a small data set. Any questions so far while we wait for this to, to resolve? I would have a question uh, relating to this uh, hugging face hop with uh, pre-trained models that you showed at the beginning. So um, can anyone add to this or is there some kind of uh, vetting process or? No, it's anyone can add. This is basically GitHub for model weights and data sets and there are no limits that I know of. I've I've added terabytes worth of data before and like no one <laughs> told me anything. Um, you can also add private data sets or you can add open data sets that include um, vetting or you agreeing to terms, meaning you can't access the data before digitally signing. Um, I think this is uh, hopeless. I'm gonna restart the kernel, see if that helps. Okay, better. I don't. I think it was a Jupyter issue or a DNS issue. It was supposed to even notice that I had the dataset cached, which it did right now, and it loaded the arrow file from my local cache. And we see that the objects that we get is a basically a, a glorified dictionary. So it behaves much like a Python dictionary with um, training, validation, and test as the keys and data set objects as the actual values within them. Um, this is this data set object is 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 the interface basically to 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 the to the arrow data set on on, on file and it's actually just a view on, onto that memory mapped file. Um, you can for every data set that you load, you can print the description and the citation if the authors of the data set chose to make that available. So we can have a more of an understanding of what this data set that we're about to train on actually does. So this is a data set of Twitter messages with six basic emotions. And we are going to be doing some multi-class classification in a tiny bit. Um, Right, we can load the data set object corresponding to the training split into a variable. It's a data set object, so obviously. We can call the features key, and it shows us that it's a object of task type class label. Um, and we can even 
access the function that turns these IDs, which is what the network is going to be eating into the string that they represent, because the network is not going to be trained on the sadness string, it's going to be trained on the, the integer zero, and this integer to string method is going to be what can help us make that um, translation. We can call length on it. Um, what else can we do? We can access data directly. We can slice, and this already shows you the column aspect of the data set because what you get back is this key of text and an actual list chunk of text. We can take the text um, part of that slice, and this is going to be our training data set, bunch of tweets about different things, each labeled with the emotion that is being conveyed by them. <clears throat> um, much like the TensorFlow datasets API, you can map things. So this is something that takes a row of data and returns the, tweet, the, 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 the length of the text. And in Hugging Face datasets, a map function has to return a dictionary with the name of the column. <coughs> Sorry. So what, the, what, what this is doing is taking the row of data that has a text field. It's splitting on space, meaning we, get, we take a sentence, and now it's a sequence of tokens as defined by a white space tokenizer. tokenizer. And if we take length on that, we just get a, a rough estimate of the number of words. And again, this is not the model's tokenizer. This is, we, we don't have a model yet, so it's just white space tokenization. And we feed that back into our training data set, and the thing is mapped. Um, I'm not sure if this will work because I restarted the kernel, um, but I could try. As I said, when I started, push to hub is one of the functions that you can apply to any data, to any object, actually. You can call it on a tokenizer, on a data set, on um, metric, on a model, and it will push to the hug and face hub. Let's see if this will work. Yeah. So it will, okay, should have been uploaded, I guess. I'll go to my profile and see if that's the case. Um, yeah, and our new data set with the new length feature that I just calculated with the map function is already up and ready to be downloaded by anyone um, with access to the internet. And again, this is just a Git repo in the background. It, it actually converted it to a parquet file. I'm not very sure what a parquet file, but I know Lucas knows a lot about parquet files. So if you have questions about those, but it's just a question of data format and whatever is most suitable to communication over the internet. Um, so yeah, so since now we have this, let's just look at it again, this new data set that has this tweet length feature, we can filter based on that tweet length by calling filter on the training data set. And I'll notice that I'm not actually feeding that back into train DS because I don't want to change the data set. I just want to output the filtered data set. And that's just um, a data set with less than 16,000 rows. And the way you do that is with a Lambda function, which I'm assuming you're familiar with. If not, please write in the chat how we will explain them, what that is. Um, you can also sort by just passing a column. So let's have a look at what the shortest tweets, wait, or longest, no, shortest tweets. During lectures. Okay. Um, one thing you can also do since because of the Apache backend, because of the Apache arrow backend is to do batched and multiprocessor um, maps. And this would require you to change the function a tiny bit. Instead of rows, now it's taking in a batch of rows. And if you remember how the data set was structure, structured, you had um, the key that said like, quote, text and then a list of texts. So what this is doing is 
taking this batch, taking the text field, and that's a list of text right now. And for everyone, just apply the same function that we applied earlier. And it's doing it in a, in a list comprehension, which is in itself also quite quick, which um, when applied to this, the same map function, but by setting batch to true and batch size to 2000, which was admittedly a random number because it's such a small data set that you could just do it all in one batch. Um, and I'm explicitly telling it to not load from cache because I want you to see how quick it becomes. Um, we can even time both versions of applying the map function. And I'm just gonna delete and actually just uncomment this so we have more room. And if we call the batched version, it's 10 times quicker to just write a batched version of the data set, of the of the map function. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Um, does the batching here mean that it can perform the calculation in parallel? Because yes. Okay. So batch parallel um, or? Yes, I think there's even like a, like a num, yeah, there's a number of, you can set like how, how, how parallel it has to be. I'm, I'm choosing the default, so maybe it's just, I'm not sure what the default is, but, but yeah, it is actually um, doing it in parallel. I think it's using like a lot of Apache Arrow um, magic in the background. Um, So just to remind you that we have this tweet length column that we added just to demonstrate the map function. I'm going to go ahead and remove it because we don't need it to train sentiment right now. Um, and just so that you know that you can ask also lo load files locally. If you have CSV files, you get text files, one text, one, one entry per line. If you have JSON or JSON lines, but even if you have pandas data frames, you can all you can load it without having to download from the Hugging Face Hub. You can load local files, but just specifying the file extension as a data set name, as it were, um, which is probably what you'll do in a lot of cases when you have local data that you want to load. Um, this is this is something that I also include last minute because. It's not super relevant to what we were trying to achieve, but it's important because it's very important to look at your data before training on it, because oftentimes you'll see a lot of pathologies, you'll see a lot of silliness, a lot of repetitions and a lot of imbalance. And it's important to look at your data and to do that, you would need pandas and not an Apache Arrow data set. But since the data set object is just a view, you can tell it to change the view to pandas. And we do that by calling this set format type equals pandas um, on, on our data, on our data set. And it will just transform it to a pandas data frame. I mean, the, the, the back end is still Apache Addo and it's still the same thing, but um, now we have, uh, sorry, an actual data set that we can, whoops. Oh, what am I doing? No, 10, Lucas, she corrected me. <laughs> you call a head function and you can see that it's a data frame. Then we can do all sorts of magic on it. We can add a column label name using that function that I told you about, this int integer to string function that turns these integer labels into what they actually mean. And now we can look at the data set and see what labels correspond to the labels to the integer labels. We can also do some quick look at how balanced our data set is. And it turns out it's, it's quite unbalanced. Um, most of Surprise it- Surprise is, is the most surprising label. It's very <laughs> fitting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're not gonna go into details of how to deal with imbalanced data. This is not the point of this session, the, set, the point right now is to show you that it's easy to look at your data um, once it's loaded as a data set. You can also um, look at the distribution of tweet length 
This is still the same thing that we did earlier. We're splitting on space, meaning that a sentence because it becomes a list of words, and the length of that is the number of words in the tweet. And if we call describe on that, then we get um, that on average, all tweets are 19 words. The longest tweet is 66 words. Obviously, there's the upper limit that's set by Twitter itself. You can do all sorts of um, introspection right here, but that, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to reset the format to the um, native data set object, and we can see that it's back uh, to a data set and no longer a data frame. Um, Right, so this is, as it were, the, the most important part of it all. This is the, um, the, the, the part of the library that let, lets us use the actual models. And um, just out of curiosity, uh, have people heard of transformers or of BERT or GPT-2 or GPT-3? Just um, react in the chat if you, okay, very nice. Okay, cool. Um, some of you, again, this is just, yeah. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. One key takeaway is that there, there's a taxonomy of transformers, three large categories. You have the encoders, you have the decoders, and you have the, the sequence to sequence transformers, which are in gray. The encoders are in blue. This is your bird style models. This is what you would use to do um, named entity recognition or um, text analysis, text classification, I mean. Um, and the red side is the GPT style transformers, which you would use for things like auto regressing a sentence. So you start with a word, you feed it into the model, the model tells you what the next word is, and then you feed that into the model, both words, and then you auto regress a sequence like that. And in the middle are your sequence to sequence tasks or architectures, which is honestly where most of the research is right now. Um, but the, the, the key takeaway here is that there are different architectures and it's depending on your task, is how you'll choose what architecture you're going to use. We want to do sequence classification. We want to take a sequence of words and give it one label to the entire sentence and not one label per word. So we're going to um, be using BERT for sequence classification. And we're going to be using a, a first of all, a TensorFlow version of that, which is where the TF comes. And the distill part is to indicate that it's a special version of BERT that is smaller and that has been like squeezed down to, to a much smaller size that is still able to, to, to be as competitive as the large cousin that is BERT. So distill meaning, if you'd like to look into it, it distillation is a very interesting topic and it's, it's, it, it studies how we can take these massive models that don't fit on our local machines and turn them into small models that do, but are still as performant as the big models. Um, we are going to need a tokenizer for our model because the tokenizer has to be the same one that the model trained on. And the particular checkpoint on the Hugging Face Hub is the one called Distilbert Base Uncased. Uncased, meaning that the tokenizer um, does not care about uppercase, lowercase, everything is normalized into lowercase. So you have an um, understanding of what the normalization is doing here. Um, and this for sequence classification pattern is something that you'll see a lot with these models on Hugging Face Hub or in the Hugging Face library is that you have an architecture, which is what we saw in the previous slide but you also have a smaller quote head on top of it, which is a small um, addition that, that, that fits the model for a given task. So we're doing sequence classification. So we're, we're using the classification head, but you could also use a named entity recognition head, which instead of looking at 
the one token to, that represents the entire sentence will look at each and every token and try to classify whether it's um, whether it's a named entity and what kind of named entity it is. But um, if you look at the documentation of the library itself, you'll see a lot of these tasks and you'll see a lot of um, these sort of patterns. And it's good to keep an eye on that. And if you if you remove the tense, the TF part, then you're basically dealing with a PyTorch model. Um, oh, wait, did I, did I run this? Yeah. Now, now that you have a, a model that's been trained, maybe it's good to, to remind you that these models, all of them are already trained on something. Now that something is not the tasks that we're interested in. What this specific model has been trained on is just a task of modeling language without actually doing something with it. So it's trying to guess um, words, it's trying to guess whether two sentences are, um, follow one another. But it was not trained to classify tweets or the sentiments of tweets, which is what we're interested in. And there are two ways to do that. And it's called transfer learning, by the way. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. You can do transfer learning by taking a model, which we have done, freezing the weights, saying, okay, whatever this network has learned is enough for me. That's a good enough representation of language. And well, what I will do is just put a head on top and only train that head. So the output of this grayed out step is going to be a, a vector embedding of the entire sentence. And you can train a scikit-learn model. You can train a small Keras model, what have you, but the gradients are not going to update the model itself. And it, if you're interested, this is something you can do on on your own, maybe report back in the um, in the Discord, whether you, you were able to, how well it performed. But we're not going to do that right now. We're going to do a complete fine tuning, meaning that everything that the model has learned we're not going to forget it, but we're going to update it slightly on top of that new head that we added on top. So everything is trainable in the setting that we're interested in. And to do that, we'll first start by um, loading the tokenizer. And I hope it loads. Yeah, it does. And this is the same sort of tokenizer object we got when we trained our own tokenizer on Moby Dick. So if you pass a, a batch of text, wait, I'll run that again. Then you get a tensor that is ready to be fed into the network. Well, not quite, but still. Um, and if you notice, since the tokenizer object, which by the way is written in Rust, which is why it's so quick. So you're basically interacting with Rust, so with Python bindings, but most of the heavy weighting is being done in Rust. Um, and since that lets you parallelize tokenizing very quickly, um, and since it, it, it can take a batch of sentences, we just saw that the map function is able to operate on batches. So if you combine the superpower of Rust with the superpower of um, Apache Arrow, you are able to tokenize your entire data set with, with a batched map function. So we just have to do And remember that we need a dictionary to be determined, and that dictionary is going to be the new column that is output by, by map, right? And so if we define this tokenize function, um, and if we call a batched version of map, but I'm just saying batch size equal none here because the data set is small enough to be just considered one batch. So all the parallelization right now is just going to be um, on the Rust side. So there is no parallelization here for uh, Arrow, but it should be enough for us. Um, right, let me just get out of presentation mode and move this to its own slide. So yeah, we now have 
a trained, um, a tokenized train data set, a tokenized validation data set, and tokenized test data set because we applied um, the map function to all splits of the data. And since we're using a TensorFlow model, you remember Niklas's introduction to TensorFlow datasets, and which is what we need to train the TensorFlow model, and which is why we're going to use the 2TF dataset function that is available on Hug and Face datasets. And what you need to provide is what columns of the data set should be included and which one of them is the label column. So label does not, let me show you what this outputs and it will become clearer. Wait, hold on, Jesus Christ. The tokenizer knows what the what the fields are, and the fields are input IDs, which is the the integer that represents this particular token, and the attention mask, which is um, what the model will ignore once you pad it with the padding token that we defined. And if we tell the the, the TF TF to TF data set about these columns, then it will turn just these columns into fields of our TensorFlow data set. We provide the label, we provide shuffle equals true for the training data set to, um, to, to make sure that we don't have weird artifacts in the data that will mess with our, um, with our training. We provide a batch size of 64. And this last thing, honestly, is, is, is a breaking change that, that, that wasn't um, there a couple of days ago when I was developing this. A data collator is also part of the Hugging Face library, and it's also something that you use a lot if you're training your own models. And what it's doing is it's preparing your already tokenized data into a form that is appropriate for your task, because it's a huge headache if you're doing mask language modeling and you need to implement a logic that masks tokens at random 15% uh, of the time, or if you need to, to, to some weird logic that is related to a task that you're training, the data collator will do it. In this case, it's not doing anything since everything is already ready from the tokenizer. It's just, I'm not sure it's even padding anything, even though it's a padding collator. Um, because the tokenizer is already able to pad your tensors into a huge batch. But anyway, it's a, it's, it's a required field now, and we pass basically a collator that just does nothing. And with that, we have three TensorFlow data sets. So we've moved from a hugging face data set to a, to a TensorFlow data set, and we are able to just to convince ourselves to just take one, meaning one batch, and it's going to be batch of 64 and print it. And we already see that this is a transformed version of the data that is um, all but ready to be fed into the network. You have a batch of 64, which is that shape. We have a maximum length of 87, which has been chosen as the um, length of each sequence because the longest sentence in our data set is 87 tokens and we want a very regular shape to be able to um, make use of massive GPU parallelization. Um, um, now, all that's left to do is for me to actually instantiate um, the model itself. Um, I'm <clears throat> I could have written the number six here, but it, it was just to, to, to show you that you could also safely infer the number of classes from the data sets object, which, which is what we're doing here to, to make sure that you're not adding any um, error into your code. And the model has been loaded probably because it's already cached on my machine. I'm going to load, am I going to load TensorBoard? Yeah, let's load TensorBoard. Um,
and check back on it later. Um, we define two callbacks. A reminder is a, a callback is a function that is run every once in a while. And you define what once in a while means. It's a function that lets you mm, peek in to the training as it, because training is an uninterruptible process. So you have to be able to have some small channels of communication, either in or out to change things or to see what's happening. And we're defining two of those. We're defining a tensor board callback, which tells the model or actually the training loop, hey, whenever you finish an epoch, please save all your data into this folder. I'd, I'd like to be able to look at it. And this other callback is, is saying, whenever you finish an epoch, please save it to this directory and then git push it to the to the hugging face hub with this name so what i'm doing here is saying the original model name which is distilbert based uncased and adding fine tuned on tweet sentiment just for me to be able to remember what is this model um, just further proof that this just git in the background nothing fancy nothing um, too difficult. And I compile the model. I tell it what optimizer to use. This is, again, just um, implementation details, which you will learn more about um, in, in later lectures or ask about it in Discord and we'll happily answer your questions. Um, the loss function is just cross entropy. And by the way, um, a very a useful hack is to never ever let your network output um, have 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 a softmax in the output layer. Um, the loss function can handle that, and it's much more numerically stable if you let the loss function handle that because doing the Combining the softmax with, with the actual steps necessary to cross entropy makes it much more numerically stable. So our network right now is outputting just unbounded logits. And it's the loss function loss function's job to take those, to take those and um, do whatever is needed with them to, to calculate cross entropy, which is why I'm specifying from logits equals true. Um, and if you're wondering why it's sparse, it's because we don't have one hot vectors. We have like integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 5. And this is just a version of cross entropy that handles integers as opposed to, uh, to one hot vectors. Um, but this is, <laughs> if you take one thing from this entire talk is always use from low just equals true and never put a softmax on the output of your network. And if you go into the TensorFlow documentation, you'll, you'll see a much better explanation as to why it's more numerically stable. Um, and that's it. I think we're ready to call fit now. And I'm almost scared to do it because once we start, we won't be able to stop it. Well, we will be able to stop it, but let's maybe take questions now while we wait for... Right. So this is running on GPU, by the way. So when you run it locally, you might have to fiddle with the batch size and maybe um, change some things, or maybe just wait until you're introduced to the cluster next week before you run it, if at all. But yeah, once this, when this, once this training is done and we're able to look at the uploaded model on the hub, it will, it will have been that for me. Um, maybe this is also a good point to mention that um, if you ever need GPU access, that for some reason you can't access our cluster for your work or don't have an own GPU to work with, um, that you could always use Google Colab, which is an online hosted service by Google, where they will provide you, I'm not sure what the limit is, but you can get quite a large amount of processing power there for free. Um, up to TPU instances, I believe. Um, unless you return them at any point during training. So yeah, it should be colab.google.com. So if you ever have 
anything that doesn't run locally anymore, it's, it's too slow locally, just maybe try it on there and it will most likely work. Because yep. it's one of the Google data center for you. Maybe you should, uh, or you could show the tensor board in the meantime. Oh yeah. That is a good idea. Let's see if, oh, wait. <laughs> It's, uh, I think because TensorFlow is hogging the GPU, so the entire desktop is being a bit, it's not playing nice with the browser. Okay, so we have one epoch, so one data point. Can you still hear me, by the way? Uh, we, can, we can see you with the screen share as well as your... Um... Yeah, let me go ahead and... Uh, yeah, I can't even turn off my camera. I, I have no control until training is done. Um, uh, maybe also nicely, the... but I can do the thing of we can't stop training anymore. Exactly. Um, maybe should... also the logging frequencies plays a role here in, in TensorBot. I don't know whether this is just the first epoch. And then it's waiting um, until the default value, which may be much higher than what you're be. even training. I don't know. Yeah, I think the problem now is just to wait for a couple of minutes until. Um, Maybe should... while we await, uh, there was one mention in the chat, you, you can get access to the scientific computer cluster of the university, which is a thing that I didn't even know existed. But um, thank you for the suggestion. I, I think um, this is actually restricted to research activity. So oh, you would have to file a proposal, but maybe also for a student thesis, thesis uh, it, it would be possible. I don't know, but uh, I guess explore and find out um, if you, uh, yeah, if you want to have access there. Cool. Oh, um, so training is done and it's currently uploading the training artifacts which is the model itself, the model waves, which is this, I don't know if you can see it, but this TF model point H5 thing and the actual TensorBoard logs, which you'll also be able to, to access online. And if this doesn't take too long, which it looks like it's taking too long, then we can actually look at how it looks once you upload a data, uh, a, a trained model to the hub. And does anyone have any questions while we wait for the pro progress bar to fill? Was the logic equals true thing learned the hard way or did you know from the, from the get-go? No, I think someone told me. I don't, I don't remember. I think it's one of those like, hey, don't ever... Like it's it's very weird that the framework does not tell you in a warning message. Um, they do tell you in the, in the documentation, but not any other way, which is weird to me. I think there's another point that we should keep in mind there when we use this from logits or we don't use it, which is that if you don't use uh, this from logits, then it's actually required that you have normalized probability vectors of with course, sum yes. of one, which is something that uh, is mostly learned the hard way, actually. Uh, but yes. um, the other way around, some implementations, I think, claim to be equivalent to calling softmax in before, but, but I'm not sure. Um, maybe I would also have to read into those documentations that you talked about to understand this further. So it's, this seems to be taking longer than I hoped, which is why I will just go to a random. Um, model to show you what it looks like. Um, when you use the push to hub callback. So this is a model that was trained on code but also used the callbacks that we saw. And whenever you have 
um, something that looks like it could be TensorBoard logs in a hug and face repository, then it will automatically add a training metrics tab with a, like, with, with a live TensorBoard instance for you to be able to look at the actual um, runs, which is super useful, especially to communicate results. Um, one other thing that's that I wanted you to see, but unless this finishes soon, is it will actually create a readme file for you. It will tell you what uh, what data set from the hub this model was trained on. It will create a table with metrics for every epoch. So just something to keep your um, to keep in mind when you when you use these callbacks is that you also get this the community the science communication aspect of it it's not just like an, a, a model that's been pushed and anyone can use it but rather it tries to make it in a way that's communicable um, What I wanted to show you, but again, we have to wait until the model has been uploaded, is that now that model that I just trained randomly on my own computer, it can be accessed by anyone. So if you were to run this after the model has been trained, you'd be able to, to try it locally. And this pipeline workflow that we saw that only takes text, that doesn't require any um, um, complicated code. You can even, with this one line, load a, um, a small GUI interface that lets you uh, interact with the model. But again, this is something to try yourself if we, if we don't end up having the chance to do it here. Um, Any other questions? Oh, we, we can now see the, the actual tensor board. Um, with red for training and blue for validation. Again, it's just three epochs, so it's not too much data. Maybe tying back into the lecture, um, we saw a very similar graph in the last uh, five minutes where Benno mentioned overfitting. Um, so this is exactly the kind of graph that's plotted here. And at some point, the the loss of the validation set will probably stop decreasing, uh, which means you found your local or global optimum in the in the, uh, in the validation data or in the test data rather um, but the uh, training loss will continue to decrease uh, to some point and if these two intersect at some point that's exactly where Benno mentioned it in the in the slides um, that's where overfitting occurs by the way could you adjust smoothing to zero please um, so yeah this is actually the real. Uh, uh, yeah. Can also look at the graph that was generated by TensorFlow, and this here is our model that's already been compiled, so we don't get to see what what's actually. Um, the attention layers and all that within it. Um, just to go back to what Lucas was saying, you can also see what you can see it here, right? Because this is um, validation accuracy and wait. Mm, actually, we can't. 
we can't probably we, we can't see a good pattern because it's just been trained for three epochs but i think i was somehow thrown out maybe uh not everything i said got through or uh, did it good until the smoothing thing yeah smoothing was the last thing i heard <laughs> okay yeah yeah everything we saw before that before you put smoothing to zero was interpolated so don't be fooled by the values that come out there okay yeah sorry Um, I think we can end here. I'll, I'll post the link in the discord when the, when the model uploads. So unless you, you want to join us in watching the progress bar slowly make its way up to hundred percent, I think. Um, Although progress bars may be unreliable as per the error message. <laughs> True. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess we'll stick around for a couple of minutes until it finishes. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, either ask now or ask later using Discord. Um, and yeah, welcome to try all these hiding face features in the meantime until next week. Um, next week, we will talk about Slurm for the first time. Um, let me just quickly check the schedule. So we mentioned Colab, we mentioned this university scientific computing cluster, and we already mentioned our cluster. Um, and of course, you need some way of distributing different computing tasks on a cluster. You can't just have everyone log in via SSH and basically free for all compete for the resources. Um, so that's where Slurm comes in. It's a cluster framework to make it much easier to work uh, computing clusters. Um, and then next week, we will uh, slowly, but surely in the next sessions, get you to be able to work on there um, to well exceed the resources we have uh, available locally and maybe also do parameter sweeping with some, some big training tasks where you would need uh, external hardware for. Um, so we will next week just start with locally developing a simple model and then deploying the simple model on the Slurm cluster just for illustrative purposes. And then in the week after on the 9th of May, um, we go into a bit more large scale things and actually work on, on the cluster um, to do some parameters looping. Um, so yeah, um, I guess then either ask questions or we will see you next week for the next session. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I want to also say a special thanks to Christopher for oh, yeah, right. presenting I this forgot, session. I forgot about that. that was... um, Chris is not part of the normal teaching stuff, but since he's sort of the hugging face expert in the group, he agreed to uh, give a little insight about that. So thank you. I am part of every insight. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, there is one question in the chat. Uh, what do you think about the Flare framework for twin models? Um, I don't know enough about it to be honest to uh, to have an opinion. Could could you could you tell us more about it, Jonas? I've only heard the name in passing, but does anyone else hear? Um... Yeah, I, I actually, I'm sitting right now in front of the office of the guy who did it. Um, it's Alan Ekvik. Uh, in does he, Berlin, does but... he know you're sitting in front of his office? No, no pro probably not. I hope so. Uh, I hope not. But um so I can confirm that it's under very active development and I often see him committing late at night uh, and, and merging new features into, into the library. But um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the availability of pre-trained models. So if you go to the Hugging Face Hub, you can actually pre-select or pre-filter um, Flare-trained uh, uh, models. I didn't check it out recently, so I'm not quite sure. 
maybe this would be a point where you I come actually, in. I think I know that I know someone who who is on that team. Um, so yeah, we there are oh that's that's always good interesting so 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 weights are hosted on the hub but the flare library will make it easier for you to use these weights is what you're saying i'll have to um try it out myself i, I really don't know what it is except having seen it here on the hub but it does seem that there's a bunch of um chain yeah. models i think it, in, in in the beginning it's I think it started as a token classification library as a whole, but mm. um, I'm not very sure to what they developed it uh, in, in the meanwhile. Uh, but Speaking of which, there's something that I did not um, really talk about, is that the hub is not just home for deep neural networks, but you also have um, more traditional pipelines, traditional in quotes. Um, so you have spacey models, the same models that you're used to in, in, in your spacey workflows are also available, officially supported on the hub, but also Stanza by Stanford NLP. Um, and you can host your own models. You just have to write the push to hub and from pre-trained um, uh, functions. So. If, you're, if, if, if your model can be saved to disk and be loaded from disk, then it's very easy to just create a wrapper around it and to, to basically host it. Um, um, ah, there are even flare models that don't come from the flare organization, so. Yeah, right. This this is the filter that I meant, but I'm, yeah. I never tried any I of see. those. Okay. I don't know. Wait, I think if we go into it, maybe we'll get. Um, because, uh, yeah, you get use and flare, and we. I see. You get the workflow that is needed to be able to load that model into flare, and this is what I was talking about. So. This load function is basically what you'd have to implement to, to turn your load from disk to load from the hug face hub. And this apparently is big enough for it to have its own like snippet here. Um, also something that, that I forgot to mention is that whatever resource you navigate to, you'll get one of these snippets. This is the snippet to be able to use it in the library. And this is the git snippet if you just want to do it from the terminal, which I, of, which I often tend to do. Um, um, again, I'll uh, double check that. Oh, the thing is, is finished. So everything has been upload it to the hub. We get some information here that this model is a fine-tuned version of the model that we used. I can't see if people are still here, <laughs> by the way. Am I just telling Lucas and Niklas? Um, yeah, I still see 20 people, people are actually here. Oh, so great. Thank you for sticking around. Um, we get how well it performed. Um, we get a hosted inference um, thing that we can use to basically use the model in the browser. Um, I don't, oh, I can't, I'm blanking right here. I can't think of. Lucas, give me a sentence, please. It has to be tweet, a tweet style sentence that has some sentiment. Um, Quick. Um, uh, great, great session with Christopher Kiki today. Thank you. Uh, good try. I'm not gonna write my name. I say? mean, it's going to be unknown tokens anyway. So. Great session. How dare you? Great session <laughs> with this today. Compute. Now the model has to be loaded because it's not a 
one of these famous models like GPT-2. So as we wait for that, I'll open this training metrics in a new tab. Um, and the same plot. that we saw in the notebook um, is available just to, to use online. Did everyone else hear that? Yes. What was that? I, th I thought it was outside my window, but I'm not sure if my- No, no, it was some, up so much it, it was a digital sound. That, 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 that mm. I just heard. No? And I guess I didn't hear it. Okay. I think so. Maybe I got a notification when this was finished. Anyway. Ah, yeah, that's possible. Yeah, but um, that was probably not broadcast. Then. Yeah. So it's 92% label one, but I forgot what label one was. And since I messed with the data before pushing it, I think. Yeah, because I only pushed emotion with length, so it couldn't. Can I see if I can well, joy? Was it joy? Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> I guess it is joy. I hope it wasn't surprise. <laughs> I am terrified. Compute label. What is this? Four. Oh, right. It's about fear. Um, Check that. Yeah. So, one last thing I wanted to do. Well, that was what does that look like? To, so we're, we're getting 93% accuracy on the test set, which is quite nice to be able to leverage the, the, like the knowledge that is already in this model and just do a tiny bit of work and turn it into a decent sentiment classifier on our model. Now we can, since now the model is publicly available, I can load it into a pipeline by specifying my, my, my username and the name I gave it. And if you're wondering about this device equals minus one that you see in, the, in my call set pipeline, it's to force it to load the model on CPU. And I just don't want, ugh. I just did not want it to call the GPU before I ran the training loop and I'm just doing it on CPU. Um, I should take a second because I don't think this is cached. I mean, it's either that or DNS issues again. Kind of relief that the Zoom, Zoom session kind of kept working until now and didn't cut out half of it. I did not have any issues with like normal things. It's just specifically Jupyter notebook cells that need to either download something or push something is what I was having a trouble uh, issue with. Uh -huh. I see Jonas has written that fine tuning is extremely easy in Flare. I really have to check out Flare. Um, maybe Niklas can knock on the door of whoever it was. It was Alan Ekpik, but I don't know what is here currently, actually, but. Seems like a DNS issue, right? Because 200 megabytes shouldn't take. Yeah, this is a similar okay. issue to earlier when we were trying to load the data set. So. I mean, we can just leave it as, a, as homework. Um, if we want to check out the link is public now, so, or the model is public, not the link. Um, yeah, let me try it one last time.
Yeah, I'm starting to think this is a Jupiter issue rather than a DNS issue, but it could be both. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I think that's right. it for me. Uh, well, then I will just stop the recording for now. Um...